kind of laughing. We, in 2003, we started to have wildland fire use modules. You guys remember the use modules? They don't exist anymore because wildland fire use doesn't exist as a policy. Now there are wildland fire modules, right? Wildland fire modules? Yeah, but they used to be the wildland fire use modules, which I think they sh wish they still were. And I, I guess to a degree, I wish they were too. Uh, at least it was more, you knew what they were anyway. So we ended, what I say is we, we ended a short, confusing affair with AMR. Uh, it ended openly. In other words, it ended as our national policy, but it continues privately because in 2011 we got our new policy, which is, and if you guys don't know this, and in reading some of your pre-work, there's still a little confusion out there. We only have two types of fire now. We have planned fire and we have unplanned <coughs> fire. Okay, we have basically wildfire that we didn't plan, and then we have planned fire, which is prescribed fire. And that's it. The cool thing about that is that you can, what did I say, you can uh, manage unplanned as planned, but not planned as unplanned. So it's pretty crystal clear about what we do. So that's why, you know, again, it's just, um, really what I'm trying to say is, so plan, so you can manage unplanned as planned. So if it's, if it's an unplanned fire, if it's a wildfire, you can manage it however you want, however we want, however the line officers want, however the, uh, the whatever, but you can't, obviously, if you plan fire as unplanned, you can't do it. That's a prescribed fire as a wildfire. Obviously, that doesn't work. But anyway, our policy allows us to take to do the exact same thing that appropriate management response allowed us to do. It allows us to burn uh, or uh, suppress part of the rough fire and let another part of the rough fire go. This is why I say it um, ended openly but continues privately. So it's kind of, in my way, kind of a sneaky way of doing it. This is my take is that um, AMR was too hard to explain to the public. I just don't think they got it. They just couldn't understand that we were trying to do something by letting the fire burn. We weren't being just derelict in our duty. So we get, we get our cake and we eat it too. I think it's a dishonest approach that goes back to the roots of the Forest Service saying, just leave us to us. We know what's best. Because that's what we're doing, right? The public doesn't really know what we're doing with this current policy uh, because it's not called fire use. It's not even called appropriate management response. It's not called anything except for unplanned fire. And we say that we are managing the fire. That doesn't say anything. Um, I think some teams and some units are doing a better job than others of trying to educate the public with that. Um, but I also like it because um, it does allow that professional sort of um, room uh, for us to do what we think we should do. Because we truly are the professionals in fire management and if we're doing our jobs correctly then we should be, you know, taking into account these ecological factors and these things that um, we can use positive for, use fire for positively. Um, anyway, but there's little oversight besides professional ethics, right, at the unit level. Right? There's not a whole lot of oversight on that if we screw it up. And the cool thing about it is that if a fire comes ripping out of the hills, we don't have to say, well, we just let it burn, you know. We just say, well, we tried, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Think about this. This is our policy now. I actually like this policy in a way, uh, although I, the only thing that would mitigate this for me is if we're taking the time to educate the public about what we're doing out there. So I'm hoping, if nothing else, the current policy that we have now will give us that time to bring the public along with us. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay. And then we're swirling the drain. I know you guys are getting tired. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about this, the National Cohesive Strategy, which we talked a little bit about yesterday. And it derived from the FLAME Act of 2009. There's a few things in the 2009 FLAME Act. Uh, but it directed, the Congress directed Interior and Agriculture to develop a cohesive wildland fire management strategy. In other words, Congress is like, what are you idiots doing out there? You need to come together, you need to figure out this fire thing once and for all. That was kind of what Congress said. Uh, there's also some funding mechanisms that are associated with the Flame Act, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, they defined the, the vision for the next century, which is the century we're in now, the strategy is to safely and effectively extinguish fire when needed. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Uh, to use fire where allowable also makes a lot of sense. And as a nation, come to live with uh, wildland fire. I, I really like the notion, National Cohesive Strategy. I think it makes sense. I think it's pragmatic. Um, what it's actually going to end up looking like is kind of, I don't know, kind of like water through the fingers. I think I think it's what you make of it, but. I think it, I really think it's the most practical and pragmatic thing that I've seen so far. So there's three goals, which are also very nice, succinct goals, restoring and maintaining fire resilient landscapes, 
So creating landscapes out there that can handle fire, right? It can handle characteristic fire. Creating fire adapted communities so we stop burning down our towns and responding to wildfire because we, I mean, we got to realize that we're not going to not respond to fires. We might drive up to it and decide not to put it out, but at least we're going to respond to it. Um, we're always going to do that. And the goal is to do it together as a nation in a cohesive manner. That's why it's the national cohesive strategy. Three phases to it, which are done now. Um, don't need to get into it. Um, all this stuff is on the community page, by the way, in the uh, Not Dead Lands uh, group folder. Um, how does fuels management fit into it? It's a little difficult to ex explain that exactly because it's hard to ferret that out, but there are some barriers that have been identified. One of the barriers is inefficiencies in the national qualification standards, but that doesn't really matter for us. Removing policy barriers and the processes um, for sharing resources. It says not only for wildfire, but also for fuels with prescribed firework. In other words, we should all be able to help each other out, which to this day probably doesn't really happen too much. Um, but at least it opens up that mechanism and provides that national intent for us to be able to do that. Um, we'll see what that looks like in the future. And it defines some critical success factors as well too. Uh, one, increase fuels management on private land. So it goes back to my whole conversation yesterday about what I'm trying to do. I believed in it before, but now I've got something that I can point to and say, hey, you know, the, the big bosses are saying that we need to increase fuels management on private land. I also personally believe that the future of fuels management is going to have a big part on public lands, but really the untold story is the fuels management on private lands. Working with state and local cooperators and working with private landowners to educate them on what they need to do. Um, obviously it says increase fuels management on federal land for these reasons, and, and this is another one we don't talk much about, growth management, land development, and zoning laws. As a fuels management officer, I mean, in reality, you should be at every land development and zoning uh, planning committee meeting for your local government. I've never been to a single one. Our planner, Jeff, uh, has been to some, and he's pushed the company line. Um, he's actually graduated of this curriculum, which is good. Um, but these are things that really matter a lot to fuels management. Alpine just went through their uh, land use zoning plan. It was like this long period, and so we provided a lot of input to it because we didn't want them doing a lot of this intermix crap, you know, where they're taking these 40-acre properties and dividing them into like five and three-acre properties, you know, because that's going to be harder for us to deal with. And we told them that in our land management plan, we have stated in our land management plan, any new growth that butts up to the Forest Service, not our problem. It's in our land management plan. We'll deal with the stuff that existed before 2005 when we signed our plan. Anything new, not our problem. So it's up to you to, to zone it correctly and appropriately. So we're not doing fuels projects on any new communities that butt up to the Forest Service. That's what we say anyway. So anyway, with policy, there's some consternation. Implementing prescribed fire is always complicated. You know, smoke, blah, blah, blah. Um, implementing mechanical can have other issues. Some people don't think mechanical is appropriate. They don't think it's natural. You read all the Keeley stuff that absolutely hates it. Um, and then implementing whatever you want to call it, wildland fire use, AMR, unplanned fires. If you really talk to people about it, people are, are unsure about it because of reasons related to the unknown. You know what I mean by reasons related to the unknown? Why they wouldn't like it? Because it could like be on the hook for it. You know, they can't control all the variables. Yeah, because you don't know what's going to happen. You're looking to burn, and you might have the best intentions. Um, there, what was it? That, what was that fire up north? The Reading fire? Wasn't that one? Wasn't that Lassen. you guys? Or was that Lassen? Yeah. That went from Lassen Park to Lassen National Park. Okay, yeah. So, like, the park, park service was trying to let one burn, and they lost it, you know? It turned into a big deal. Okay, so we're so getting fun. close to... What's that? Yeah, here's my sandbox again. So, in my opinion, and I, you know, I've heard some of you guys echo this, I would look at every fire as an opportunity. And I know this is pie in the sky uniform rainbow crap, unicorn rainbow crap, but I would look at every fire as an opportunity, but not a challenge. Maybe not so much in Southern California, but where fuels conditions allow, units should have quotas to manage fire, which is not crazy because it exists in Canada. Parks Canada, and there's some other places across the world that actually have a quota where they have to respond to a fire and stop and then say, is this one that's a candidate? I mean, that's part of their process. That's part of their size up. Um, things are a little slower in the Canadian Shield at times. Um, you know, obviously that's not gonna apply here, but there are places where that can apply. 
we're at least having the freaking conversation about it, you know? And then it would be really nice if line officers were assigned a quota where they needed to implement at least something and live with that risk. And we'll talk about risk later, but you know, everyone's afraid of the risk. Well, what is the risk? Are they gonna fire you? No one ever gets fired for things like this, you know? They don't. So I don't know what line officers are afraid of. They're not gonna get fired for it. They'll probably get a promotion, if anything. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, I really, really, truly believe that we need an investment of really, really detailed planning prescriptions for all our landscapes. The NFS is the National Forest Systems Landscapes. Um, it needs to be proactive. We need to look at moderate to long-term seasonality factors, adaptive management methods, and we need new research. I'm just hearing that um, the, what is that risk index in the Sierras? What's that called that Bill's uh, doing? This is the what this is what I'm hearing. It's, it sounded like yeah, actually. Yeah, I can tell you more, but I don't know exactly what it's called. It's the risk matrix. So they're they're looking they're analyzing the Sierras right now, right? And they're looking for opportunities to do stuff like this. Yeah, is what I'm into. The three central Sierra forests have already gone through their land management analysis, and so they there's not like general Louis anymore, and it's like protection zone. There's four zones now. Um, Two like movie protection zone type things, uh, a maintenance and a restoration zone. Okay. And so, uh, based on you know where fires sit on the landscape, it's an, an appropriate management response. And this breaks it down to give you kind of more backing to make that judgment call that this would be when a fire starts, you can look on a map and say, well, this is maybe a candidate to, yeah. to let burn. So it gives you it gives you background, like you said, and guidance. Right, and allows you to do it. And now they're basing uh, all of the Northern Sierra uh, land management plan revisions, uh, excluding the Tahoe Basin, because they just went through their review, um, that they will use this process for their land management plan review or revision. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, sometimes stuff like that can be really thick and it can be hard to understand, especially when you get into this deep modeling. But the intent is that we're trying to get somewhere with the use of fire. And they're trying to put heavy hitting science behind it. And I think that's what we're going to have to do. And another thing is we have to do a better job of identifying our desired end state for what, what do we want the landscapes to really look like? What is the I mean, we're going to try to restore it. Okay, cool. What does that look like? What's the snapshot in history? What do we really want? That's my opinion. Again, these are my takes. This is what I think we need to do. I've been thinking a lot about it. <laughs> this is my opinion. But most importantly, I think fields professionals should be informing fire managers all summer long. I would love to see fields managers, especially in timber forests, transition from being a fuels officer in the summer to be like a fuels advisor in the summer, um, where they don't, you know, everyone wants to go fight fires and all that sort of thing, but you know what I mean? I think fuel, the fuels management officers should really be helping to <coughs> inform these managers, but what happens is that the fuels people sort of drop off in the summer and then the fire management officers come in and the line officers and no one really listens to them, in my opinion, and there's all kinds of differences, but I would love to see them be sort of like these advisor roles where they're like, hey, we got a lightning fire here, you know, it goes through them, and they're like, hey, that's in one of our candidate areas, and you could argue that the fire management staff is responsible for that, and they are, but I really see that as a role for fuels people to, to take into account that they start helping to try to define these um, opportunities. I think that's what fuels people should be doing. Um, and then making decisions based upon that input. That should be the specialty. Okay, um, I, I'm almost there. We have other directives and policies. I, the only point of this slide is that there's stuff like at the regional level, like right now we have the Region 5 Fuels Management <coughs> Strategic Plan, which is actually pretty cool. It has a whole list of things that uh, the regional offices put together that we should be doing. I'll try to post that on the page. Um, we have the Ecological Restoration Initiative. Locally, we have the Chaparral Restoration Task Force, which I don't even know what the heck they're doing there. Um, we have direction from our forest supervisor, our land management plan. Um, the only point of this is just saying that we get a lot of direction. We get a lot of policies and guidance, and we have to try to incorporate all the directives into what we're doing. Um, so we're evolving. Um, it's more, more now because there's been a lot of attention. There's been a lot of panic responses because you get large fire years. Our national fire plan, by the way, our target is unrealistic. It's way more than we ever do. Um, but this is what I'm trying to get to, and this is the most important thing that I'm going to talk about today, which is that managed fire, if it's just fire on the landscape, let it burn, completely ignores the fact 
that fuels a lot of times are not ready for the fire to be introduced. And I can't overstate the importance of this. It is a fallacy to think that you can just let fires burn on the landscape and you're going to get the desired fire effects that you want because we've been mucking things up for so long that the fuels aren't characteristic. And as I always like to say, is you're, not going to you're never going to get a characteristic fire if you don't have characteristic fuels. Make sense? You're never going to get a characteristic fire if you don't have characteristic fuels. So until the fuels are ready and until we have managed the fuels to the point that fire can be introduced, you're never, almost never going to get the fire that you want. So this is a misunderstanding. Um, you know, and this is why we moved away from some of those fire use and appropriate management fires is because they'd go let it burn and it would freaking nuke it and destroy the area, it would destroy the habitat, the watersheds would be all jacked up and they're like, but we let it burn, isn't that what we were supposed to do? And completely ignored the fact that there's seasonality issues that are associated with it and the fuels, if the fuels were three times as much as they should be, do you really gonna think you're gonna get the fire effects that you want? In one of the readings you gave us, yeah. For the pre-work, Dr. Biswell, I thought, had a really great statement when he said we've had, or we've removed fire from the landscape for 100 years. It's irrational to think that we can bring it back in a short amount of time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is a lot based upon Biswell's line of thinking. You're absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that up. So, um, yeah. So just keep that in mind. Is that you know when you're out there on the landscape and, and if people want to sort of be this hero for just letting a fire burn, a lot of times it ain't going to work out and it's because the fuels are not ready. Again, you're not going to get a characteristic fire if you don't have characteristic fuels. So just That's what I wanted to get to and that's what I want you guys to understand is that uh, fuels is still very, very important. We need to be going and doing these mechanical fuel treatments. We need to get out there. I hesitate to even say this, but it, it's almost paradoxical in that we almost need to keep fighting fires for a while. Right? If you think about it, one of the best things we could do is actually to keep fighting the fires until the fuels program can catch up. Is that ever going to happen? Where's the money? you know how much money we spend on the Cleveland for fire suppression versus fuels? Any idea how much the, the PR budget is for this forest? Millions of dollars difference. I think we're, we're at least $14 million for our PR budget, if not more. That, that might not include the offset. I get a million and a half dollars. Okay. Now, all the other forests are like that. That's 14 times as much money going to putting out fires as to fuels management. Good or bad, I'm not making a statement, but it's interesting. It's the same way. Our infrastructure, our reason for being, our white hat riding is all based upon us putting those fires out. And we've reached a point now where, in a way, it actually kind of makes sense to keep doing it until we can fix those fuels. So, yeah. Statement, but maybe a question too. You know, like. Uh, we had a lot of our burn, the mountain fire. Yeah. And now that started on the lower, but it ripped up to our wilderness, which became a, a field-driven fire, really. Yes. Yeah, yeah I was up there. I was. I had a division up there in the wilderness, actually. Yeah. And and I know the statements then were well over 100 years before this was burnt in such a way. But a wilderness, on the other hand, is easy on the land. You're not even supposed to use chainsaws to cut down dead trees and they want dead trees to fall and it's like, you know, if you're waiting to retreat a wilderness area, I've never seen that yet, really. No, wilderness is probably the most complicated because in the San Jacinto wilderness up there, it's chock full of dead and dying white fur. Huge big trees. Huge big trees, but there's a lot of white fur up there and it's because there hasn't been any fire up there. Yeah. And so, honestly, areas like that, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to get nuked off and it's going to have to get restarted and hopefully in 100 years when the stand's back somebody will, in our place will be there to allow a fire to burn through characteristically that's yeah. the only thing we can really hope so, for so it's like you know how many wildernesses do we have and increasing we added another wilderness this year we have and this was on uh, you know because you have a lot of jurisdictions mixed into your area but we had via a land yeah that hadn't burnt in a hundred years. We thought that burnt, but it was by the Anza area, and um, and they were all shocked. But it was in Manzanita. Manzanita was huge, really, really tall stuff, and that kind of nuked some stuff out. But you know, that's VIA. You're talking about um, wanting to be able to work with other agencies to be able to do stuff like that when you're mixed with all that kind of other stuff. And that's just our district. We're not as big as you guys. We probably all have it one zone, 
but you guys are split up like way more than I think. Yeah, we are. In more areas. Yeah, because of that, it's harder. So. Yeah. Yep. No, that's great. Um, I'll tell you what, I know everybody wants to take a break, so uh, I've pretty much got to where I wanted to get to in this lecture. Um, so we'll see what's left and see if there's any other points, but well, I think we've talked about it. So let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, take a good 10 minutes, and we'll come back and start looking at group projects. Thank you, guys. Good comments, good discussion. Actually, not We hit it. Thanks, Aaron.